Um, feel continuing this mini course. Well, thank you. Um, so previously, uh, I talked about how geometry and topology sort of coincide in dimension three due to geometrization. Um, three manifolds have this geometric decomposition. And in the most important case of hyperbolic geometry, that geometry is in fact unique. So any geometric invariant is a posteriori of a topological invariant. I also demonstrated um, sort of black box, or I guess it was my computer, it's a silver box, um, that you can actually find hyperbolic structures in practice. And if this is going to be useful for solving the homeomorphism problem, as I claimed it was, um, that's something we need to be able to do. And so what I'm going to do today is basically talk about um, how, how you do that, how you encode a, a hyperbolic structure um, so you can tell it to a computer. And in the course of doing so, I'll give a bunch of examples. I mean, I really haven't given a single complete example of a hyperbolic three manifold, uh, and I think I kind of owe you one. So, I mean, well, here I'll give you an example, but this won't be very informative. You know, I'm just going to write down the answer, um, and then I'll explain sort of how you would go about finding this answer. Um, so, I mentioned that if you take the exterior of the figure eight knot, this is a hyperbolic manifold. Um, so, this is a quotient hyperbolic three space by some group. Uh, and I can tell you what the group is. Right, the isometry group is uh, PSL2C. So I need to give you two, some two by two matrices. And in fact, I just, this case is generated by two elements. Um, we're here, zeta uh, is primitive sixth root of unity. And so it turns out that the quotient of hyperbolic three space by that, um, this group here uh, is this. But the question for today is how would you figure this out? Or more interesting, how would you figure this out for say a hundred crossing knot, like I demonstrated um, at the end of my last, last lecture. So let's, uh, as a motivating example, let's drop down a dimension so it's easier for me to draw the pictures. Um, let's think about hyperbolic surfaces, right? So the isometry group of two-dimensional hyperbolic space is also two by two matrices, but it's the two by two matrices with real um, entries. Um, and that comes from thinking about the upper half space model for hyperbolic space. So at, we're now in the, say, complex plane, take everything with sort of above the real axis. Um, so the metric here is a multiple of the Euclidean metric, um, but um, it scales up as you go towards the boundary. Um, so in particular, you know, my picture is if here's something and it moves towards the boundary, it gets smaller and smaller. If it moved up, it would get bigger. Okay. Um, and uh, so a matrix here corresponds to Mobius transformation acting on uh, the Riemann sphere. Um, and since if it has real entries, it will preserve the real axis, right? And so it preserves this upper half part. And these are exactly the isometries of the hyperbolic plane in, in this model. Um, so one of the uh, funny facts about hyperbolic geometry is that triangles behave very differently than they do in Euclidean geometry. Um, their angles don't add up to pi, they add up to less than pi. But what's even more bizarre is that they have bounded area. Okay, so I can actually draw sort of a, a, a biggest triangle I can imagine. I'll draw another one over here because they're fun to draw. All right, the GD6 in this model are circles meeting the boundary at right angles, which includes vertical lines. I'm thinking the point at infinity is on that, on that circle. Um, and so you might look at this and think, wow, this is giant non-compact thing, right? Because the boundary is not there. These, the edges are asymptotic as you go out. But in fact, uh, the area here is simply pi. Uh, exactly pi. Uh, you can do the integral, um, uh, but, but actually the, the easy thing to see is just that it's finite, right? So if you just look at one of the ends of this triangle and use um, your metric there and integrate, you'll find that that's a, a finite number. Uh, and any triangle is sort of contained inside this one. Uh, so you have this ideal triangle, and actually there's only, up to isometry, there's only one. Uh, because Remember, I'm about to tell you, if you don't know, uh, facts about Mobius transformations. Um, 
for a Mobius transformation, you can take any three points, for example, these three points here to any other three points. So there'll be a unique Mobius transformation that takes these three points to, corresponding the point infinity, those three points, uh, and that will transform this one triangle into the other. So there's just, um, there's just one of these things. So uh, I'm going to focus today on things that are like this example that are, um, they're not going to be compact. Uh, they will turn out to have finite volume. And I'll explain a little bit more like the, what the ends look like, something I neglected to do uh, previously. And the reason I'm not just working with closed examples, which are sort of more comforting in some sense, uh, is that uh, they're really just harder to describe concretely. So I, I'd be hard pressed to do that in an hour, but I can actually describe some of these. And then this is also the way that Snappy uh, thinks about it, using these idea of Thurston that I'm going to tell you about today. Okay, so um, so let's. I want to build a hyperbolic surface using these ideal triangles. And uh, my surface, I'm just going to take the two sphere and I'm going to remove uh, three points. So before I had S three and I removed a circle. Uh, now I just have S two and I'm removing three points. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two of these ideal triangles. And I'm going to think of them as sort of two copies of the same triangle. Um, and I'm just going to glue the indicated sides together. So I'm basically doubling this triangle across its boundary. Um, and so when I do that, well, what do I get topologically and metrically uh, is I get a, a sphere uh, minus, minus three points, one for each of these ends. Um, and that, this is a, a complete hyperbolic metric. Um, and any questions so far? I know it's a half an hour earlier, so everyone's still asleep. Yeah, so, so I'm really thinking of these as sort of, as, as they're sort of, I, right, so the, you know, what's asking is, you know, see each one of these sides, of course, it looks just like a segment, but, well, maybe this one looks kind of infinite, and they're all infinite, right? These are infinite GD6, they're isometric to R, right? If you, if you, if you take this, this thing here, and you, you start here, and you integrate up and down, you find that's infinitely long. Um, and so we actually have a choice of how we glue these guys. Um, and I want to glue them so if I regard this and this as essentially the same triangle, like two copies of the same thing, I'm gluing by the identity. Um, and maybe one way to formalize that is I could draw, I could, there's the biggest inscribe. Just, I like the upper half space model because it's easy to compute in, but somehow it looks a little asymmetric. Here, this is in the point gray model. If I center this about the origin, here we have this sort of biggest inscribed circle. Um, so that gives us, we like points, sort of a natural zero on each of these lines. And here I'm gluing so those zeros match up. Um, and so that's, that's, and we'll see that's very important. So I'm kind of glue, um, blue to blue. We'll see in a minute what happens if I change that. So in fact, uh, I can write out the, the group that corresponds to that. Um, and that's what I have uh, over here. Um, so, so what we have is, um, so we're supposed to have two triangles. Maybe I'll call one of them blue. Okay. Um, so here we have a, a triangle and here we have a, a blue triangle. So here's the blue one, here's the non-blue one. Um, and I wanna identify this edge to this edge. Um, and I'm gonna identify this edge to this edge. And if I do that, that's like a basically folding across the middle. Uh, that gives me my thrice punctured sphere. And the group that does this, so we could look at the matrix one, two, zero, one. So this corresponds to Z goes to Z plus two. So here at the bottom, minus one, zero, one. So that's just a translation in the Euclidean sense. Um, that moves this side to this side. Um, and then in additionally, I need to take the matrix one, zero, two, one, which corresponds to, well, that's uh, Z goes to Z on two Z plus one. Um, so this fixes zero and takes minus one to what? Where does minus one go to? Can anyone do arithmetic? <laughs> goes to one, that's right. So this thing here 
so, so this is what's called a parabolic isometry. It's sort of fixing a unique point at infinity, sort of translating. Uh, this is also a parabolic isometry, except it's fixing the point down here at zero, and it's rotating the G D six that go out to that point um, from left to right. In particular, it takes minus one to one, so it takes this to this. So these two G D six, sorry, these two transformations, they glue this to this and this to this. Um, and consequently, this is in fact the quotient of H2 mod lambda for lambda equals this particular. And of course, this is sitting inside SL2Z. Um, this is an example of sort of an arithmetic um, lattice, uh, as was the figure eight knot complement that I started with. Um, and we'll come back to that um, in my final. Final talk. We've talked about arithmetic manifolds, and you've now seen two of them. Here's one, um, and the figure eight knot complement is another. So, uh, Ian gave a nice quasi definition of, of arithmetic. I have a different one, uh, which is that arithmetic means it's a hyperbolic three manifold that number theorists care about. Um, and particularly, they have very powerful tools from monomorphic forms that can tell you about like their cohomology. And that's one thing I'll talk about in my last, my last lecture. All right. Okay, so this is just an example. Um, and I still wanna stay in dimension two here for a little bit longer. And let's think about how we would, how we could use this perspective to study um, hyperbolic structures on uh, sort of arbitrary surfaces of finite area. Um, so like maybe instead of, I should draw this bigger, sorry. Maybe we're interested in studying hyperbolic structures on a once punctured torus instead of a thrice punctured sphere. Um, and the way we can do this, so we'll mirror what I'll do in dimension three, is we'll work with an ideal triangulation. So this is something that's just built from triangles with their edges glued. So the vertices are all at the punctures. The vertices are at the punctures. So this. This is a purely topological notion. Um, it's not a geometric one. So, so the idea might be that, so I'm gonna make things kind of squiggly. That's supposed to be my indication. This is not geometric, right? If I take um, two triangles like this, glue them together and then glue opposite sides, right? That's the torus, the usual picture of the torus. Um, and so we could think about that all these points become identified. You could think about that as giving just our usual example from Hatcher of a cell complex structure on the torus. Right. So we, this will be sort of where we start from. Right. This is certainly a very combinatorial thing, right? It's just described by how many triangles we have and which sides we glue. It's amenable to feeding into the computer. And now to, uh, we're trying to find a hyperbolic structure on this thing. Um, and so then what we'll do is we'll realize by hyperbolic uh, ideal triangles, right? So we had no, no really choice there. There's only one, um, but uh, we do have to choose how they're glued, right? So as, Daniel pointed out, we have, um, you know, when we have two of these triangles glued together, so let me, this is, let me, let me do a, a modified version of the example I had there. So, so here's our thrice punctured sphere back, our thrice punctured sphere. Um, when we decide along an edge to glue the two ideal triangles together, we have this choice of parameter. Um, on how we identify these two isometric copies of R, right? We can translate, we can shear. And depending on how we do that, we get a different metric space. Um, so, so a particular along any edge, you see something like this. So here's the, these inscribed, maximal inscribed circles. Um, and so along this edge, maybe I'll orient the edge. Um, uh, 
there's a sort of a shear here, which is just a number that records um, uh, how far you go from this blue mark to this blue mark. So the one we started off with, um, I was just using shears of zero on all the edges, right? But we could change that. These are the same, so maybe we'll label it one. I could change one of them to one. And so that describes a different hyperbolic structure um, on the thrice punctured sphere. Um, but this one, now there's something new that we have to worry about. Um, well, we should have worried about it before, but you all very polite and let me just ramble on. Um, the question is, uh, is this metric complete? Right? We really want to deal with you know, complete Ramanian metrics, just like say complete in the sense of a metric space. Um, and uh, the original one was, uh, but this new one isn't. Um, and so this is on the homework. So the answer is no, uh, it's on the problem sheet, but I'll give you a hint we got here in time. Right, so we have this thing where um, uh, we have this shear. So this is the vertical edges are the red edges. So there's no shear here, um, but there is uh, a shear um, when we go from this, this, so this is our red edge. The middle, the middle edge is the white edge. Um, as we go from um, this side to this side, um, what happens is um, we have to move up to get to the blue mark. So the blue mark from the other side is here. So when we go, in particular, if I go through this way, I actually appear, um, let's see, so the way I'm doing it is it's supposed to go up. So it actually appear down here. Um, and so let me go the other way. So if I go to this point, this point now um, appears up here. So we run along this um, and then we can calculate, this is part of the homework, you have to do some calculations. Um, you'll find that you move up and you move farther and farther up. Um, and then if you look at how long this path is, this path turns out to be finite length. Um, and consequently, if I, for example, take the middle point of each of these segments, that will be a Cauchy sequence. Um, and it doesn't converge, right? It's clearly trying to get out to infinity. So there's some condition that we have to worry about um, in order to make a complete hyperbolic method. And, and we, generally speaking, want to look at the complete ones. Question? Sorry? Um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so if all the shears were zero, um, the, uh, it was okay. If I make this one one, we have a problem. And one of the homeworks is determine for these three choices numbers, determine which ones give you complete things. The hyperbolic structure on the three functors is completely determined by the shear. Yes, yes, that's right. This is a way of, of encoding. Um, and so you can also do the same thing here, right? So we could take here's our once punctured torus. We have three numbers to associate to those things. Some of those will give you complete things. Some of them won't. Um, you can figure out which are which. Uh, and and then you'll see sort of the Teichmuller space of the torus emerging, if you're familiar with that term. Yeah, it's just, it's just translation along this axis. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I didn't put this on the homework, but I, I should have. Um, you can actually figure out what the uh, um, com metric completion of this is. Um, and it turns out that the metric completion of this, I'll just draw it in here because it's fun to draw. It's not complete, but this is its completion. Um, so, so you add, if you take the metric completion of this thing, uh, you add up ending two GD6 and you get this sort of hyperbolic structure on a pair of paths with, with GD6 boundary. Okay, so we've seen these um, finite, uh, finite area or finite volume hyperbolic manifolds that aren't compact. Um, and I really could tell you sort of what, what the ends of these things look like. So these are the cusps. Um, so in 2D, 
I've already drawn sort of the only kind of cusp that you have just comes from, so from the upper half space model here, it's like you take a region like this and glue the sides. Let me say if Z goes to Z plus one, um, in 3D, the kind of end that you have now will turn out to have a torus cross section. Um, and you will get these from, so we'll do the upper half space model of hyperbolic space, maybe coordinates X, Y, and, and Z, sorry, and T, I don't want to use Z, I'm kind of already using Z. Um, so here we are, uh, our upper half space. So if we look at a plane, I don't know, maybe at height one or something, um, then we could maybe look at a unit square in this thing. And look at kind of the chimney that's above that square. Um, and then we could uh, act on this region above this. So this is one of these horospheres that came up in the computer demonstration. Um, it does. It looks funny because it's through the point at infinity. Other horospheres look in this picture like spheres that rest on the boundary. Um, anyway, we could look at the. Uh, so right. So now we're in three dimensions. So PSL two C is what we're looking at. So Mobius transformations, for example, we could take the one that shifts by one in the horizontal direction and one that shifts by one in the vertical direction. Uh, and so if I set this up, so this is say uh, zero, zero, one, this is one, zero, one, make this one, one, one. Okay, these isometries would, for example, glue this face to this face and the front face to the back face. Um, and that would create this sort of non-compact manifold where you have these cross sections are all Euclidean tori. They're all similar to each other. Um, and one of the homework things is you calculate what is the volume of this. And it turns out to be finite. These, these tori, they're shrinking in area so quickly as you go out, um, the whole thing ends up with finite volume. Um, and so then the fact, which I'm not gonna prove, is that uh, so the end ends of uh, orientable finite volume two or three hyperbolic manifolds are all of this form. So if I have a finite volume complete, have a complete hyperbolic manifold of finite volume, uh, then uh, these are what the ends look like. And um, there's some choice here. I mean, this is not the, 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 we have this torus here, right? And we could have chosen that torus to have a different shape we could have taken a rectangle or some parallelogram. So there's, there's some flexibility there. Um, and in higher dimensions, uh, it's the same deal. It's just that the, the cross section here is some Euclidean manifold. There are just more Euclidean manifolds in higher dimensions. Okay, so, um, so now we know what the, uh, if we have a, a complete finite volume hyperbolic three manifold, uh, we know its ends are all tori. So, one way to reinterpret this is to say that, so if M is complete hyperbolic finite volume, then, okay, you might initially worry, well, this is a non-compact thing, it could be crazy. No, the, the ends just look like this. Um, there's also, I, I should say, only finitely many of them. That's maybe not obvious, but it's true. Um, and so consequently, um, Topologically, M is going to be the interior of a compact manifold with torus boundary. So then M is uh, N minus its boundary where your N is compact uh, with boundary uh, uh, union of tori. So this is, we'll call this the interior of N. So in the example I keep drawing, right, when I have a not like this, then the manifold N is 
we remove, so here N would be like we take the three sphere and remove a little open neighborhood of the knot. And then the other manifold we were looking at was, well, we were just taking S3 minus the knot. Um, and this thing is actually the interior of this. So now we want to apply the strategy um, that I had from uh, the two-dimensional case to finding hyperbolic structures um, on, on the manifold. Um, and so, well, again, we'll look at an ideal triangulation. So this will just be a collection of uh, tetrahedra uh, with faces glued. I mean, the reason I'm not saying simplicial complex is that um, in simplicial complex, simplices are determined by their vertices, right? And if I'm doing something like this, there's only one vertex, but there are plenty of simplices. Right. So that's why I'm just, this is, you know, a delta complex or maybe slightly more general if you're familiar with Hatcher's terminology. So it's a collection of these guys, let's call it T, um, so that, um, let's say if we delete the zero skeleton of T, so we remove the vertices, um, this is homeomorphic to M, right? So just like in my example here, I'm thinking about the punctured torus, the um, they're my ideal triangulation, um, you know, and we actually, we, we could put in the vertex that gives us a, a, an actual just torus without boundary. If we delete that vertex, that gave us the thing we were finding the hyperbolic structure on. Um, uh, or equivalently, uh, T minus some neighborhood of the zero skeleton is homeomorphic to N, which we prefer not to, not to worry about. Um, non-compact things. It's like truncating the, in 2D, I'm just saying lop off the vertices. And that would give you something like, which is kind of corresponds to the. Um, so example, uh, figure eight. Um, uh, so this thing has an ideal tetrahedron triangulation uh, with exact, with uh, only two tetrahedra. Um, this is, discovered by Thurston, it's remarkably difficult to visualize. Um, I'm certainly not gonna be able to describe this uh, in my remaining half hour, kind of crazy. This is the basic example, but uh, there you have it. Um, but, but let me, so, so you always, so it's a theorem that you always have one of these. Right, this is again, just a topological decomposition. Um, but maybe I should, um, just give you a, convince you I can at least build some of these things, right? This sort of seems like I'm describing this. So um, well, maybe, maybe I'll, I think I'm gonna have to let you take a bit on faith that these things exist. Um, and maybe if there's time, I'll come back to that. In the notes, there's an example of how you build uh, a ideal triangulation if you have a, a three manifold that fibers over the circle. Um, in that case, uh, you, you start with an ideal triangulation of the fiber, and you kind of implement the monodromy as a sequence of edge flips on that triangulation. And that has a three-dimensional analog um, that you can actually build. But let me just to make sure I actually get to the theorem at the end. Uh, let me maybe postpone that discussion. Okay, so, so this is like our topological input, which again is very amenable to, to feeding into the computer. And um, so now we want to uh, do what we did in two dimensions. So I wanna make each one of my topological tetrahedra, an ideal, an actual geometric ideal tetrahedra. Um, now, the situation in three dimensions is more complicated um, because, so let me draw my, again, kind of work in the upper half space model here. Um, so what's a, well, actually, let me, things always look so asymmetric there, it kind of bothers me. Um, so anyway, this is the kind of thing we have for an ideal tetrahedron. Um, it's determined by four uh, points on the sphere at infinity. Um, and it's no longer the case that they're all isometric um, because Mobius transformations acting on the, the sphere at infinity, you can take any three points to any three points, but that's it. 
you can't control the fourth point. There's a there's an invariant which is the cross ratio. Um, so there's sort of a cross ratio of four points. So we actually have different different um, ideal tetrahedra. Um, let me draw one here. And here's our our tetrahedra. Um, but we can. So we want to understand what the what the geometry of this thing looks like. So I can take I can pick any three. Um, vertices and send them to some standard points. So um, maybe let's say we're interested in this edge, um, kind of focused in on that. And I'm going to send uh, this point to zero, this point to infinity, and this point to one. All right. So that's where they're going. So that, that's not actually those points. So here's actually the point zero. Here's the point one. And then there's a fourth vertex, which I don't know where the, the fourth vertex varies. So um, after doing this, making my edge vertical at the points zero, one, and infinity, uh, the fourth point here is fixed. Um, and so um, we'll call this number here, this is the shape parameter um, of uh, this edge. Um, and, and so there's a two-dimensional moduli space of, of these tetrahedra. And I mean, it's very much, re remember in our metric here, um, which I didn't write down, I guess, right? It's T is my vertical direction, just scaling down like this. So in particular, um, if I fix T, I get a Euclidean plane. That's one of my horospheres. Right? They're called spheres, even though they're not spheres and their geometry isn't positively curved. I'm not responsible for that. But if we look at the intersection with one of those porous spheres, uh, we're just getting a, a Euclidean triangle here. Um, so, so really, the, this, this uh, now of course, it's not quite well defined which one of these I pick, right? Um, and, and so it's not actually a triangle, it's more like a similarity class of triangles. Um, so so that's, that's our moduli space of these guys. Uh, so, so I guess I should say, um, Maybe this is homework too. Uh, that once I know the shape parameter for one edge, it determines the shape parameter for all the other edges. Uh, so, so in particular, one shape parameter uh, determines the rest. I'll write down the formulas and you can kind of check them. So here's zero, one. So, um, Let's say we're interested in this, the parameter here. Um, that's our parameters Z. Uh, so I, I'm kind of thinking about these. So this is the point Z. This is zero and one. These are kind of like complex dihedral angles or something like that. Right? So if the, if the, so the parameter associated with this edge is Z, let's say, then the parameter associated with this edge turns out to be uh, one over one minus Z. And the one associated to this thing is z minus one over z. Uh, this is just, you know, if you know your one angle of a triangle and you know the length of this side, well, of course, we can compute these angles. Not, not deep. Um, and uh, so then the setting. So here's the data structure that Snappy uses under the hood um, is you have an ideal triangulation. Um, and then each tetrahedra. Uh, has a shape. We just pick one edge since one edge determines the rest. And uh, a complex number, which we don't want to be a zero or a one. Um, yeah, zero or one would correspond to taking this thing and moving it to one of these things that collapse uh, the tetrahedra down to an ideal triangle. Um, and that's not going to be interesting for us to describe the, the hyperbolic structure. So, so we'll, we'll uh, exclude that. Um, and Okay, now when we had before in two dimensions, um, there was a choice. So, so here we've now, before we had no choice in two dimensions for the shape. The shapes were fixed, it was one ideal triangle, but we had to choose the gluing maps. Um, here, uh, there's a choice of shape, uh, but there's no choice of gluing maps because the things are being glued along ideal triangles. There's only one ideal triangle. Okay, question, yes. Um, 
For the moment, I am. Uh, I will eventually exclude that. So the question was, am I allowing Z to get down on the x-axis? For now, yes. And I'm also currently allowing Z to be in the um, sort of have negative imaginary part. And I'm also going to not like that in a minute either. OK, so, so we have the shapes. Um, and uh, the gluings are determined. And we also have to um, worry about completeness, right? We learned that from the two-dimensional example. There's, that's going to be some probably condition on the shapes. Uh, but there's something else we do have to worry about now, um, which, uh, right? So we, we have our, um, an edge. So we have a, well, you know, we have this thing. It's built out of um, tetrahedra. And if we look at an edge in our triangulation, um, we kind of look down an edge. And what we see is a whole bunch of tetrahedra, right? Kind of glued together. So I, should I try to draw this? Why not? You can only laugh at me. All right, so we basically have something like, right? So this is, I have a whole bunch of tetrahedra that are glued together around this edge. Um, and here I'm just drawing this schematically by saying I'm looking down, down on that edge. Um, and so in particular, uh, I've assigned, I've, I've got shapes assigned to each of these, these things. And if this is really going to give us a hyperbolic structure, um, one thing that has to happen is like the dihedral angles around this, it better add up to two pi. Right. If I just chick pick these shapes at random, there might not be enough enough pieces that when we come back around, we can glue up, or there might be too much. You might sort of wrap around multiple times. Um, just think about like if I, you know, the we had this cusp, right? We're we're sort of thinking about these Euclidean triangles. So if we're going to be making a hyperbolic structure on the three manifold, we also have to be giving like a Euclidean structure to its cusp. And those, those triangles were actually Euclidean triangles, right? And you're just piecing together Euclidean triangles trying to make a, um, a certain Euclidean surface. And so you better have things like the edges have to, to have the same length, so they glue together, and that, you know, once you're done, there's two pi angle about these things. Um, so, so actually, it's more than just an issue about the angles adding up, although we do, we do need that, um, because... Uh, because this is sort of the situation that you have. Okay, so here's, right, each one of our tetrahedra has a, a parameter at this edge. Let's say the first tetrahedra's parameter Z1, which means, okay, this is zero, this is one, um, and this is Z1. So I'm looking down from the point at infinity, right? So you should think there's an ideal tetrahedra coming out at us. Um, and now I have my next tetrahedra over here, that has some parameter Z2, okay? And so I take that tetrahedra and I slide it over and I glue its face um, to, this, to this face. Um, do I dare draw this in 3D? Maybe I don't. Yeah, why not? Let's draw it in. All right, so here we have our initial tetrahedra. And then we have another tetrahedra over here. Where the parameter here is Z2. Um, and then we're supposed to take this thing. So we're going to glue, like, say, the front face of this thing. And this is the problem of how I drew this with the back face of this. All right, we're going to take this and slide it over and lock it, lock it in place. So if we view that from above, okay, we're going to get this thing. And this parameter here is Z2. Um, and then we'll have an, we'll go on another one, Z3, and so on. Um, and what I did valence, I think six there. Uh, maybe after I assemble my pieces, I get this. All right, this is not good because I'm supposed to be gluing this to this. Um, and even if the angles had added up, this thing might be too short or too long, right? It might be okay the angle wise, but it sticks out to here. So we need to make the shapes. You know, satisfy something so that fixes this. Um, and beautiful thing is that this is actually very simple to express in terms of these complex numbers. Because see, this vertex here is actually a complex number z1 times z2, right? Because, you know, the parameter here is defined by taking this triangle and sort of 
doing the similarity that rotates it down so that it goes from zero to one, right? That was the original. This is basically equilateral, I think. So this is my original Z2 here that's used to define this angle. So if we want to take this thing and send it to here, that's just like we're just multiplying all those complex numbers by Z1. So that turns it into this. Um, and so then, uh, what is this going to be? Yeah, Z1, Z2, Z3, right? And so then this final one here is Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5, Z6. Da, da, da. And so then the condition, the edge equation, uh, for each edge, we have to have just that the product of the parameters at that edge has got to be equal to one. Um, and so, you know, this is a, just a polynomial, very simple polynomial equation in our shape. Are the questions so far? So the, there's also the issue of the completeness um, and uh, which turns out to have similar form. So, um, in the interest of time, let me just say this. So, so completeness of the metric turns out to be the same as, um, you know, in my picture where I, I'm building these, you know, I've got these kind of chimneys coming from my ideal triangulations. The, the cusp is going to be built from kind of these, all these Euclidean, Euclidean cross sections, right? If this had matched up, we'd get these sort of this, um, Euclidean structure on the boundary, um, but it's actually not a Euclidean structure uh, initially because the, the sizes of the triangles can change. Right here, we have one copy of tetrahedra two, and maybe we glue some stuff together and we build it out and we get another copy of tetrahedra two over here. Its shape may be bigger or smaller. The angles are the same, but it may have dilated. Um, so you get something called a similarity structure and completeness is equivalent to uh, the similarity structure on the boundary is actually Euclidean. So it actually describes the Euclidean thing. And so that's, that's the, some issue about like dilations um, and rotations being one. Uh, and it turns out that it's a very similar kind of thing. So you get equations for this, which are also of the form. Now, really, I, of course, these are really some indices you get one of these or two of these, depending on how you think of it, equations per cusp. Um, but they, anyway, they evolve, they're both very much the same. So they're, they're still of the form something equals one. Okay, so, so then the, the theorem, so this is due to Thurston, uh, is that, uh, so suppose we have an ideal triangulation of our three manifold, um, and we have some shapes um, satisfy these edge and cusp equations, which again, I emphasize these are very simple um, algebraic equations, polynomial equations. Uh, so once we have um, such shapes, then we have some kind of thing that looks pretty much like a hyperbolic structure on our, on our manifold, um, but we do need to restrict it slightly. So, so if in addition, we have that all of the, imaginary parts of the shapes are positive. I'll explain these things in a minute. Um, and two, uh, at each edge, oh, I just erased it, but we had, you know, for the edge equation, it was sort of that when you go around, uh, you had to come back to where you started. Uh, I want to rule out that you sort of went around multiple times before you came back. So for each edge, I want the sum of the arguments of the ZI. So, so for each edge, the sum of the arguments had better be two pi on the nose. So it's a four pi. Um, so then, conclusion, um, then these shapes uh, define um, a complete hyperbolic structure. Um, and, uh, and moreover, if we want to say, you know what the volume of these guys, of the manifold is, a complete hyperbolic structure on M of finite volume. Maybe I'll emphasize that. Um, and in fact, the volume, well, okay, it's going to be the sum of the volumes of the individual tetrahedra. Um, and that turns out to be some, it's a function of, of, of Z, the 
block, uh, block Wigner dialogarithm function. Anyway, some special function. We don't need to really care too much about it. Um, this is a nice function. I shouldn't, shouldn't denigrate it. Um, this is less than actually 1.02 times the number of tetrahedra. So it turns out there's a, uh, an ideal tetrahedra, right? So the, it's not clear from the pictures that I've drawn, but there, as we vary the, the shape, the volume of the tetrahedra turns out to change. There's actually a unique one of maximal volume, which is the most symmetric one. It's the one whose cross section is a, a uh, um, equilateral triangle. Um, and that has volume 1.01 something something. Um, so this is then how uh, uh, you can directly find hyperbolic structures on, on these kind of manifolds. Um, any questions? And so let me end with just uh, uh, no, because the edge equations permit uh, the sum being four pi, for example. Yeah, oh, I said I was going to explain what this. So, so the point is that um, if you have negative, uh, we, so, so I've always drawn this picture like, like this, because I've always been thinking about having a negative, so a positive imaginary part. But if it had a negative imaginary part, like maybe we could have this one here, right? This is a different one. Um, and now if you're trying to, maybe this is the case Z2 is a, has negative. Then when you're doing this sort of thing where you develop around an edge, um, you would end up doing something like this. This is where you put, this would be Z1 times Z2. That's Z1 and this is Z2. Uh, yeah, well, so we have this and then we end up doing something like we're sort of folding. And that doesn't define a good geometric structure along this edge. So this is really the condition that, that um, everything glues up. So other, other questions? So last time I, I mentioned that, you know, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they're different. Um, this is one example of that. So we have this nice um, theorem that partially erased. But it says that if we have these complex numbers satisfying these polynomial equations, plus some, you know, little other conditions about them, um, then uh, we get this hyperbolic structure. So, so now you say, okay, theoretically, what do we do? So, you know, we're defining, it turns out that local rigidity of hyperbolic structures will tell you that um, uh, the solution to the polynomial equation is isolated. So actually it shapes will, the shapes will all end up being algebraic numbers. Um, and uh, so in particular, then you're required to think, okay, I should, you know, use something like Grosvenor bases or resultants to solve for the ZIs. And that, that totally just does not work um, if things are large. So that's, that's sort of what you do in theory. There's a whole algebraic geometric machine that tells you how to solve a system of polynomial equations. What you do in practice, going back to the original version of SNAP-P by Jeff Weeks, um, is you just uh, initially, you set all ZI to be um, E to the I pi on three. So just make all of the things equilateral to start. Um, use Newton's method. And in practice, this converges very rapidly. I mean, if there's a solution at all. I mean, one thing that I didn't say is that not all triangulations will you be able to, even if you have a hyperbolic manifold and I have an ideal triangulation, I may not be able to find such ZI. This may be a triangulation that's sort of weird um, and, and just not sort of compatible with the hyperbolic structure, in which case I won't find anything. Um, and that's, that's we, in practice, is we rarely run into such triangulations, but they do exist. Um, but assuming there is one, this is how you actually find the solution. You just say, okay, let's start them all at the ones of maximal volume. I don't even think it really matters that you do this. You could start at like all the right angle. They're just random shapes. You just do gradient descent naively and, and you converge to this, this thing. Um, and then uh, as I hinted at, you can, so, I mean, you're doing Newton's method. And then if you want to sort of elevate this all to be rigorous, to actually come back with a proof that I have a hyperbolic structure and my shapes are all, you know, in little boxes or something like that. You just use sort of effective versions of the inverse function theorem, which is really say Newton's method um, to do things like solve the word problem, compute the volume to uh, many decimal places, et cetera. Okay, so let me stop there.
Um, well, uh, yeah, so, so, so basically either it works and you find a solution or it's, it, there's no solution. No, no, then it just, it just will give you back some solution. It'll say, this is the best I found. Um, and, and so what often happens, for example, um, you know, we talked a lot about JSJ decomposition. So what happens if I took a manifold which had a non-trivial JSG decomposition speed it into SNAP heap? What happens? So it tries to solve the equations, but it will fail. And it will fit. And the way it fails typically is that some of the shapes go to zero, one, or infinity. Some of the shapes actually collapse um, in the most degenerate way possible, not just to the real axis, but actually like vertices converging. Um, and in this case, uh, you can actually usually find the JSJ tori by looking in the tetrahedra that collapsed. Um, and so that's another thing SNAP you can do actually is it, if the solution collapses like that, you can ask it to split along the tori that it found. And so then it can, it can uh, try to find the JSJ decomp. Um, so, so this is actually uh, surprisingly open. Um, uh, so it's known that you can always do it if you allow a few of them to be flat. So you know you can always try, you can always cellulate them with ideal cellulation. But you may have to use some cells that are bigger than triangles, like allow yourself a cube or something. Um, and uh, no one has ever found a manifold that you can't do it for, but but um, that doesn't help you, to the best of my knowledge. I think not known yet. Not, not that it supports the hyperbolic structure. I mean, of course, it's a purely topological fact. I'm not sure who proved it, certainly in Matt Bayev's book um, on uh, algorithms and three manifolds, that every Manifold of this type has a topological ideal triangulation, as many of them. Uh, we understand how they're related by Pochner moves. Um, but a geometric one, there is this thing that you might have to allow some of them to be flat. Uh, but I think it's believed you don't have to do that, but you don't. Uh, so the great, great question. So the volume, so, so by Mostel rigidity, the volume you know, is a topological invariant. Um, and the answer is it does not uniquely determine the manifold. Um, one way to think about that is you know, if I have a, a manifold, I could take finite covers of it. Right, we talked about finite covers a bit. So we could take like all covers of degree 10. How many of those are there? There's probably a hundred or something. All those manifolds will have the same volume. It'll be 10 times the volume of the base manifold. Um, but probably they're different manifolds or many of them are. Um, in fact, you can show that uh, th there can be arbitrarily many manifolds of the same volume. And I think there can be super exponentially many or something like that. So it's not a unique invariant, but it is finite. There are, I should say, only finitely many of a given volume. Um, so you can't have infinitely many, but you can have more than one. I guess the mistake is very symmetrically given and very different ways. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Sorry? Uh, no, because this is an upper bound, right? So, so you might have. In fact, so, so it's not the case that there are finitely many um, manifolds of bounded volume. Um, so it's like if you take the whitehead link and you do higher and higher Dane surgery on the whitehead link, you generate a family of cusp manifolds, all of whose volume is less than that of the whitehead link. Um, and what's happening there is, so in particular, it's infinitely many manifolds, so infinitely many triangulations. So the triangulations are getting very complicated. What happens is some of those tetrahedra are very thin. They contribute very little volume. Um, so no, I don't think it follows from that formula. Uh, this does say though that that if I this does say things like if I draw a knot, uh, there's a way to mechanically go from that diagram to an ideal triangulation, um, which you can read about in Jeff Week's paper that's linked to on the course website. Um, then you will see that the volume of the manifold is bounded by a constant times the number of crossings, where that constant is like five or something. Uh, okay. yeah, okay. Are, are there uh, unboundedly many, uh, uh, as well as three manifolds that are pairwise incommensurable of the at the same volume? I, yeah, I believe that's true. Yes, but I'm not, not, not 100% sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, I think you do something like you take various sort of pieces that are arithmetic from sort of different groups, and you start assembling them, um, and and you can show that somehow these you don't get a, if you do it enough different ways, they're not all commensurable. But it's kind of related to, to what Nicolay was saying. It's like you take a bunch of pieces and you just glue them, something symmetric, and you glue them in a bunch of different ways. And this thing, Nick, you think?